My name is Amin Abedallah, and I'm happy to introduce our next speaker for this session, The Struggle uh, for Justice. This session will showcase ways in which a growing coalition of grassroots organizations is influencing American public policy debates on Palestine and spearheading the path for effective and effectual advocacy for Palestinian rights. Our speaker, Dr. Sama Abrashed, needs no introduction to our community, uh, but I'll go down the short list of his very extensive resume uh, before we get into his discussion. Uh, Dr. Abrashed is National Policy Director of American Muslims for Palestine, um, an organization founded in 2006 whose purpose is to educate the American public and media about issues related to Palestine. He is also a board member of the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, an umbrella organization of eight major national American Muslim organizations. He's authored several books and published dozens of studies and articles on issues relevant to the Middle East and its political climate, and is a regular commentator on uh, Palestinian and Middle Eastern affairs, as well as on the American domestic and foreign <laughs> policy. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Aburshed and look forward to his talk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to start by thanking PAC for inviting me to be here and to thank all of you for coming for, uh, to this important event. Often, as American activists for Palestine, uh, we're presented with a litmus test to whether is the glass half full or half empty when it comes to the work for Palestine in the US. However, we should not look at the glass as half empty, nor should we look at it as half full. Rather, we should look at it in its entirety if we want to be able to capture all of the components of the full picture. Otherwise, we cannot strategize and we cannot continue to advance our work for Palestine and navigate our course here in the US. Looking at the glass half empty will lead us to despair. And looking at the glass half full without seeing the half empty side of it will basically lead us to be over optimistic in a way that maybe we will create a virtual reality that does not correspond to the actual reality that we live here. So what I'm calling for here is to be aware, conscious of the full picture. Otherwise, again, we cannot navigate, we cannot continue the work for Palestine here. We should not be pessimistic, we should not be over optimistic, it is rather a call for all of us to work more and to seize on the advantages and try to neutralize or avoid the disadvantages. And I'll try to deconstruct the, what I mean by, by, by this. Let me relate what I said to a recent incident that we're still living the aftermath of it. In fact, it is still ongoing. Now, I'm going to bring this recent incident that took place not to make it my focus, rather just to try to learn the lessons from it. See the half full glass and see the half empty glass. Again, because I want us to understand the dynamics here. And I think everyone knows that I'm, I'm referring to the uh, case of Ilhan Omar and the orchestrated controversy surrounding her remarks. And I say orchestrated because Ilhan Omar didn't say anything uh, and, uh, you know, anti-Semitic. Nothing uh, that she referred to or she hinted to or that she said explicitly was anti-Semitic. Rather, what she said was more in line with the recent public opinions in the U.S. who are more critical of Israel, who are more in support of PDS rather than being against it, including Jewish Americans. In a recent poll, by the Maryland University in October 2018, Jewish, 37% of Jewish Americans said that the Israeli government exerts too much influence 
on our politics and policies in the US. So now, according to the narrative of the other side, which I will call the Zionist, for them, okay, these people might be self-hating Jews. In our case, we will be anti-Semitic. They're, they're not self-hating Jews, nor we are anti-Semitic by when we question the policies of the State of Israel, or when we question the policies of the lobby, of its lobby in the US. And conflating the two, the criticism of Israel and its lobby with anti-Semitism is a tool of intimidation to deter any free debate in relation to Israel-Palestine. They want to censor this right. They want to stifle this discussion because they know they cannot win it. So what I want to say is that, you know, when you look at this recent incident, now you can look again at the glass as half full or look at it as half empty. Let's go to the half empty. The half empty is that it is the Democrats' leadership, the Democratic leadership in the House, that introduced the initial resolution to condemn Ilhan Omar. It was Nancy Pelosi and the leaders of the Democratic Party in the House. They wanted to condemn her remarks because she questioned the allegiance of few of a few within the, the, the Israeli lobby, not the Jewish community. There is a difference between questioning the allegiance of the Jewish community and Jews to the countries that they live in, to the countries that they carry its citizenship, or they carry their citizenship, and questioning a number of people or certain individuals. Because again, what, let's, let's talk about, take this example. Saying Islam is, is a religion of violence, that's a problem. We will call you Islamophobic, definitely. Say that Judaism is a, is, is a, is, is a wicked religion, we will call it out and say this is anti-Semitism. To go and generalize against the Muslims, against blacks, against uh, uh, Jews, we will call this a form of bigotry. That's not an issue that we're going to have a debate over because there will be a general consensus that you cannot go and generalize in your condemnation or generalize when you, when, when you, um, uh, when you have an opinion about a certain issue. So what Ilhan Omar did is that yes, she questioned the allegiance of some individuals within the Israeli lobby here. Now they made it what? They made it about anti-Semitism. Why? Again, they know they cannot win the debate. So the Democratic Party introduces a bill or a resolution to condemn what she said and, in, and attempted to conflate the criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. That was the half empty of the glass. We were very upset about it. We didn't like it. Although Nancy Pelosi came out and she said, oh, this is not about the criticism of Israel, which is a first amendment, right? This is about, you know, being implicit in, in anti-Semitism. Well, they have full that the Democratic Party failed to pass that resolution. And there is a reason why they failed. The reason is that, is that most of the Democratic base now are leaning more towards the Palestinian rights. A recent poll by the Pew Institute last year showed that 27% within the Democratic Party are pro-Israel. 25% are pro-Palestine. Now this is the same party that founded the State of Israel under the Truman administration in 1948. But it doesn't end there, because the same poll showed that those who identify as progressives are, or liberal or leftists are, are more sympathetic to Palestine than they're, more, than they're sympathetic to Israel, 39% to 19%. Now, within millennials, blacks, Latinos, including Jewish, the Jewish youth, they are more sympathetic to Palestine. So the reason why the Democratic Party was not able to condemn Ilhan Omar is because they feared a backlash 
from within their own base. Whereas this, this widening gap gulf between the base and the leadership, the older leadership. Nancy Pelosi in her 80s. You know, I think Schumer in his 70s. So they understood the dynamics. So now we could say, this is the half full of the glass. But it doesn't stop there too. Because there is also another half empty. Because the same party reintroduced another bill or another resolution that condemned now Islamophobia as they condemned anti-Semitism, as they condemned any form of bigotry. We all agree with this. We have no problem. Any form of bigotry should be rejected, should be condemned. But for some Democrats, they still wanted to do, go further than that. That's why they reintroduced what? Another bill now, to, uh, to, uh, anti, an anti-BDS bill that was just uh, introduced just a few days ago by the Democrats. So what I'm trying to say is that the picture is so complex. The situation is so complex. We cannot simplify it. We cannot talk about or in terms of a half empty or half full. We have to look at the entire glass. We have to be able to understand the entire dynamics. Otherwise, we won't be able to seize on the advantages because there are the advantages. There are opportunities that now we are presented with. And I always say, you know, with challenges come opportunities. So I would say that we, every one of us, should capitalize on these advantages, on these opportunities. A, Israel is no longer a nonpartisan issue. Israel now is a debatable issue. They tried to stifle this discussion, this debate over Israel and its policies and its influence over our government, but they have failed. So Israel is non is a non part is no longer non partisan, is above partisan, no longer. Now it's becoming a partisan issue because Democrats are leaning more to be more on the right side. Doesn't mean that it will end there, doesn't mean that eventually things will work in our favor or what we see as just and as right, because if we fail to seize on these opportunities, others will come and fill, up, fill out the vacuum. So we have to be aware of this. The other thing, although the Israeli lobby is so powerful, it still failed to pass the initial, the first drafted resolution that wanted to condemn Ilhan Omar and what she said, and to conflate what she said, the criticism of Israel and its lobby with anti-Semitism. So we have to seize on this too. Now I understand that the establishment, it's not where we want it to be. But the establishment has bowed down. They still try to re-emerge, but still there is a pushback. This pushback has to continue. If we will give up on this, we will lose. A recent poll that was released just two days ago by Gallup shows that 50% of the American people are for two states. But a poll before it showed that 36% of Americans are for one state. Now, I'm not talking in terms of solutions. I'm not saying whether it's the one, st one state is better for us or two states is better in Palestine. What I'm talking about that the monopoly that the Zionist lobby had over the issue of Israel slash Palestine is coming to an end. That's what I care for. What about? That this monopoly is being shaken now. The foundation is being shaken. And we have to be, again, aware of this. The trends are shifting. The trajectory is changing in this country. And my worry is that we are more obsessed with our internal divisions. And now I'm going to talk as a Palestinian American. And I hope that everyone hears me well. I think one of our major problems here in the US, seeing all of these opportunities that are, we're presented with, are more obsessed with importing problems from back home. We are still about Hamas and Fatah. 
We are still about Gaza and the West Bank. To be honest with you, if I ask any one of us, including myself, to abandon our biases, we will be lying to one another. Everyone has a bias. Everyone has a conviction. Everyone has a belief. I have a bias. I have a position on what's taking, back, what's taking place back home. I have that bias. But when it comes to my work here in the U.S., the only thing I care about and the only thing we should care about is Palestine, Palestinian rights. Forget about the divisions, forget about the problems that exist over there, forget about the differences. We're not Hamas, Fatah, or Shabiya, or Demokratiya. We're not the West Bank or Gaza. We don't live there. Our work is here, our challenge is here. Our people accept, expect a better from us. And to see that we're still internally divided, it's going to take us nowhere. So I hope that all of us here, look at this. Take a serious look. Take a serious look. Keep your bias. Go and fire a post on Facebook. That's fine. I mean, go condemn Hamas or condemn Fatah or Abu Mazen or any. I don't, it's, it's fine. I'll do it. But when it comes to my work here in the U.S., we cannot talk in terms of building coalitions for Palestine while we ourselves are divided. Because what kind of a coalition that we're trying to start? What kind of a coalition? A coalition for what? Why well, are we going to go and demonstrate against uh, Hamas in, the, in, in Gaza or demonstrate against Fatah in the West Bank? Is that what our, our, our view of what a, co a coalition is in the U.S.? You, our coalition partners, will not come out in support. Because what they're worried about is more about justice in Philistine. And we have to be aware of this. And we have to be careful about the way we set our tone. The other thing that I want to say, we should not be divided over a one state or a two state or any form of solution. What we should be, what our focus should be here in the U.S. is about restoring the Palestine, restoring the Palestinian rights. That's what I worry about. You know, in fact, we have laws in this country that Israel is uh, violating, like the Lehi law. We give Israel $3.8 billion, and according to the Foreign Assistant uh, Aid Act in 1966, if I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact years that it was passed, you know, each recipient of American foreign aid has to account for each dollar that it receives. According to the Lehi law, no country can use the money that it receives from the U.S. to violate human rights, let alone to occupy other people or to subjugate other people. But you don't see many of us talking about the Lehi law. You don't see many of us relating the debate that we're having in this country over a border, on our, uh, over a wall on our southern borders, while we ourselves, with our, with our tax money, we have financed an apartheid wall in the West Bank. So we're not relating the experiences that we're living here, the debates that we're having here, with what is taking place overseas or taking place in Palestine. And again, this is another issue for us to focus on. Let me conclude with this. Two points. One, we as a community, and now again, we're American activists for Palestine or Americans for Palestine, we're also a community that is from a Palestinian descent. We as a community, we are the only community that have, has solid numbers, solid constituent for Palestine. Just look at yourself in Patterson here, in Clifton, in Brooklyn, in Northern Virginia, Chicago. Go to Orange County in California. We have solid constituencies. 
Palestinian Arab Muslims who are more sympathetic to Palestine. The issue is we are still unable to move this constituency, to make it more engaged when it comes to Palestine. Imagine if we can move our communities, make Palestine one of our top agendas. It cannot be the top agenda for us. But it can be one of the lists of our top, uh, one of the top agenda lists for us. Imagine if we can mobilize and organize our community to be behind Palestine, to be for Palestinian rights. Imagine how many hundreds of thousands can affect change in their own districts. Forget about the presidential elections. But think in terms of the districts, of the, of, uh, of, of the districts here. Each district has a representative. Imagine the change that we can effect. Imagine if we can have 10, 15, 20 Ilhan Omars and Rashid Atlibs, or you know, anyone, it doesn't have, they don't have to be Arab or Palestinian or Muslims. Any American who stands for what is right in Palestine. Imagine if we can effect that change. Imagine if we can, again, mobilize and energize our communities. This is a solid constituency that we have to worry about. Once we have, once we have this community, this constituency energized, then other partners will take us more serious, and then we will be more respected. But again, this requires us first to abandon our differences here in the U.S. Let's focus here. Let's worry about our, our tasks here. Forget about everything else. The last point I want to make, and this is my conclusion. You know, if we have for long doubted that we can effect change in this country. If you still doubt that we can effect change in this country, then you should not be here, or you should not be an activist for Palestine. Because what Ilhan Omar's case taught us, that if there is a pushback, then people will correspond and they will listen. We were successful in our pushback, and I'm not talking about AMP or PAC or Palestinian Americans, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, I'm talking about America pushing back. Because this was an infringement on our first amendment. If we can criticize NRA, then I can criticize APAC. If we can criticize Saudi Arabia for the crimes that it's committing in Yemen, then I can criticize Israel for the crimes it's committing in Palestine. And if we can criticize Iran for the crimes it's committing in Syria, then I can criticize Israel and I have every right to criticize Israel for the crimes it's committing in Palestine again. That doesn't make us self-hearing Muslims to criticize Saudi Arabia because it does not speak nor represent Islam nor Iran does. And Israel does not represent Judaism and the Jews. And the Israeli lobby here in the U.S., that should be registered as a foreign agent, not as an American lobby, okay? Talking about the Israeli lobby here in the US does not make me anti-Semitic because many Jews came out for what Ilhan Omar said. In fact, many former APAC officials came out and said, the problem is that what she said is right. Oh, so they wanna stifle this too? Listen, the train has departed. It departed the station. Now, whether we can reach our destination depends on us, not on our opponent. Our opponents are going to do whatever it takes to derail this train. That's their task. Our task, our challenge is to keep it on the rails. That's, that's what I worry about. Now they're reintroducing another bill to condemn or to criminalize BDS. Imagine, here in America, we Americans boycotted South Carolina over the Confederate flag and no one said this is anti-American. And the same thing Americans did 
with the state of California leading another boycott against the state of Arizona over its treatment of illegal immigrants. And no one said this is an American. But when it comes to BDS and boycotting Israel, this becomes anti-Semitic. You know why? If they cannot win a debate, they have to stifle it. That's, let them do this, let us push back. And I promise you, if we will continue this work, with the trajectory that we are on today, things are going to work in favor of our mission to restore justice in Palestine. And thank you.